Let's go. Let's start. You ready? We're in John chapter 5 today. We've done 1, 2, and 4, so we're going to do 5 today as we conclude this, uh, uh, this series. John chapter 5, starting with verse 1. After this, there was a Jewish festival, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate in the north city wall, is a pool with the Aramaic named name of Bethsaida, uh, or sometimes just known as Bethesda, by the way. But it had five covered porches, and a crowd of people who were sick, blind, lame, and paralyzed sat there. A certain man was there who had been sick for 38 years. Okay, so after the Passover festival, uh, and if, you, if you're kind of wondering what's happened because we've been talking about the north part of the country, we've been talking about Jesus being in Galilee, and then suddenly he's in Jerusalem, uh, probably chapter 6 and 5 got flipped somehow, okay? So probably chapter 6 in John actually probably in the uh, scheme of things, happened before chapter 5 did, okay? Uh, some uh, scholars believe that's the case. So anyway, Jesus is back now. He's, remember, he was up in Galilee. He's doing things up there. Now he's back in, in Jerusalem for, for another uh, Jewish festival. Um, and he goes in there, and he, and he goes to this Bethesda or Bethsaida, and uh, he's going to meet with and, and talk to this man who has been sick for 38 years. Now, there's a reason that people were lounging around, sitting around, being sick beside the pool at Bethesda or Bethsaida. Uh, most of the, the English versions leave out verse 4. If matter of fact, if you, your Bible, if you read down through there on your phone or wherever you're, where you're, however you're looking at that, it probably goes from verse 3 to verse 5. Unless you have the King James Version, which has a verse 4, most others leave verse 4 out. So I'm going to read verse 4 to you so you'll know what verse 4 said. Why, And this tells us why they're lay, laying around being sick by the pool of Bethesda. Verse 4 says, Sometimes an angel would come down to the pool and stir up the water. Then the first one going into the water after it had been stirred up was cured of any sickness. So that's the reason for them sitting by the pool of Bethesda uh, all the time. That's the reason they were always there. They weren't sure when the angel would come, and so uh, there was angels. So if you were blind, if you, were, if you uh, couldn't move, you're paralyzed, if you were maimed in any way, if you had any, um, anything that, that struggles in life, you could go there, and if you were the first one in the water, then there was this hope that you could be the first one in as the angel stirred the water and there would be uh, a healing for that. So for 38 years, John brings our attention to a man for 38 years had been sitting there. That's a long time. You know, um, ask your grandchildren, if you have grandchildren, ask them how, ask them if 38 years old is old. They'll tell you yes, okay? <laughs> Most of us are getting close to 38 and so most of us are getting kind of old. Um, 38 years is a long time to be sitting by the pool. Matter of fact, he, had, he, had, he was there hoping to be healed, but at the same time, he had lost hope. Have you ever been to that place where you're hoping against hope? Or, or you're, you're hoping, but you've kind of lost hope, and you want it to happen, but you really might be surprised if it did? Have you ever gotten there yourself because of something you've been praying for in your life? We're going to look at this happening in this man's life. We're going to come back to this man in a few moments, but, but first I want us to look at, at Jesus. I, I let's talk about Jesus for a few moments. Uh, I think every week I start off the sermon with, I came, I was going to talk about football today, but but it's never a good week in Oklahoma football just where you can just sit and talk about football, so we're going to talk about Jesus again, okay? So Jesus had gone to the Passover festival in Jerusalem, and, and while he was there, where did he go? Okay, where did Jesus go? We're going to Jerusalem. We go to the temple, right? That's, that's where you're going to go. Okay, where did Jesus go? 
The very place that he went was the place where the lame, lame people that, that, that couldn't walk, the people who were blind, the people who were paralyzed, that's where Jesus was, and he went and sought them out. That was Jesus' destination when he goes to Jerusalem. Now, remember, he has more of a reason to go to the temple than anybody there, if you'd, th you'd think so. I mean, because as he's whipping and throwing out the people at, that, that happens previous to this at, at, in the temple, at what starts getting the, the uh, religious leaders mad at Jesus, you remember what he says? You're making my father's house a den of thieves. So you'd think he would go to the temple, his father's house, be like going home, but he goes to minister to those who desperately need him. Need him. See, that's what Jesus was. He, he saw them. He spoke to them. He ministered to them. So what does this tell us about Jesus? I think it tells us that he went to people who need or are in the need of hope. He went to people who, who need to have hope in their life. He went to the nursing homes, right? He went to the hospitals. He went to the welfare offices. Jesus took time to get to know the people that most of us ignore or bypass or walk the other way around or, or just fail to see somehow. But not only does this tell us that, that Jesus spent time with some of the neediest people in the world, it also points a direction for his ministry. It points us uh, or to the ministry that we should do as we follow Jesus and that it points us toward people who need hope. If we're looking people to invite to join the journey, where do we go? We need to go to people who need hope because they're the ones that are looking for the journey that we're on, a journey full of hope. That's why we need to continue ministry to the homebound, to the nursing centers. That's why we need to continue taking communion to those who can't come. That's why we need to reach out to people who are sick or hurting. We do these things because Jesus did it. We do them because Jesus did it. So, so let's look back at the man who's been sitting by the pool for 38 years, okay? Go to verse 6. We're continuing our story here. G when, verse 6, when Jesus saw this man lying there, and remember he's been there 38 years, knowing that he had already been there for a long time, he asked them, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? It's a pretty good question. Do you want to get well? Now, you think the answer would be a no-brainer. Yes. Be very, very simple. Yes, I want to get well. But you might be surprised to learn that not everyone is ready to immediately answer the question, do you want to get well, with a yes. We become creatures such creatures of habits that we find comfort in things that even hurt us. We have a family member who um, smokes, smokes a lot, okay? He has children, and the last thing in the, he world, in the world that he wants them to do is smoke, okay? It would just tear his heart out if he saw one of his children pick up a cigarette, but he, don't put them, he, he won't put them down, Okay? Now, now, there are programs that you can get. I happen to know that his insurance will pay for anything he wants to do, any form of treatment he wants to take to get rid of the smoking habit. But this family member still smokes. He knows it's bad for him. He's heard the stories about every single person on my mom's side of the family, every single one died before they were 70 from lung cancer because of smoking. He knows those stories. Do you want to get well? Eh. Sometimes we lose hope. We've tried a time or two on our own to do things and we can't seem to do them and and then, for whatever reason, we start to embrace what we've settled for in our current situation. And, or maybe there's some comfort in, in these things that bring us. There's something 
that brings me comfort about doing this and just relaxes me or whatever it is. Do you want to get well? Let's see how the man answered him. Verse 7. The sick man answered Jesus, Sir, I don't have anyone who can put me in the water when it is stirred up. When I'm trying to get to it, someone else has gotten in ahead of me. Can you imagine 38 years? You think you know what's going to happen. You get as close as you can. And then don't you know what? You've got to go to the bathroom. And that's when the angel shows up, right? So instead of saying, yes, I would love to be made well. Yes, that would be awesome. This man simply gives him the reasons that he can't. I hit this family member up of mine, up, uh, of mine about his smoking habit. He said, don't you want to just quit? Don't you want to live to see your own children grow up and maybe even see some of your own grandchildren? His family member says, you know, it's so hard. Simply offers the reasons. That's how you can tell when people are losing hope. When instead of wanting and hoping for what, is, what can deliver them, they get caught in that trap. So I want you to know how Jesus responded to that. Don't you notice this? Because Jesus didn't say, hey, I'm here for you. I mean, because sometimes we do this. And so I think maybe Jesus sometimes does this a little differently than us. And so maybe it's good for us to look. He doesn't say, hey, I am going to be by your side. I'm going to be with you day in and day out till the angel comes. And I'm going to hold your place in the line. So if you're at the bathroom, when the angel comes, I'm going to fight everybody off. And I'm going to grab you and throw you in first. Okay? Jesus didn't do that. No, I think Jesus saw the man and he thought he didn't need to wait for another minute to be made well. And so verse 8, look at what Jesus says. Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And immediately the man was well. He picked up his mat and he walked. Yes, I love happy endings. Don't you love happy endings? Now, if I had time... To continue this series, we could go in about the other thousand people that were at the pool that day that that didn't happen to. But I, we don't have time, and I don't know that I can answer all those questions. I'm afraid I'd have to try to answer those with the Wednesday night small group, and I and, uh, can't do that. But you know, with John, that's never the end of the story. John tells us, he goes on and shares what's happening behind the scenes. You know this, how John does this, right? He says, I'm believing so you might have life. And have it abundantly. And so, so he's telling us and he's giving us all this stuff because a miracle is not a, just a miracle in itself. He's, wanting, he's showing us a, a miracle as a sign, something that Jesus is wanting to show the people so they can understand better who he is. So the story doesn't end there. So John tells us, now look at, we'll, we'll continue the last half of verse 9 and continue on. Now that day was the Sabbath. Let me tell you, that should have been the grandest thing that ever happened on a Sabbath. A Sabbath day is made for restoration, for renewing, for the celebration of worship, celebrating who God is. Now that day was the Sabbath. But continue, verse 10. The Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, aha, they come to play here, all right? He said, it's, they said, it's the Sabbath. You aren't allowed to carry your mat. It's the Sabbath. You aren't allowed to carry your mat. Not, it's the Sabbath. You're walking. This is the first time that you've had a good day in 38 years. Awesome. Let's go praise Jesus together. No, we wouldn't have said Jesus anyway, right? You aren't allowed to carry your mat. And Jesus answered, or, and Jesus answered him, the man, or the man answered, excuse me, it wasn't Jesus, the man who was healed answered. He said, the man who made me well said to me, 
pick up your mat and walk. I just did what I was told, right? Man, what a good line. Write that down. You may want to remember that. I just did what I was told. Uh, you don't need to write that. You've done that one before, haven't you? I can see that. Verse 12, they inquired, who is this man who said to you, pick up your mat and walk? We could care less that you're well. We could care less that after 38 years of you not being able to walk, that you can walk and now praise God in the temple. We could care less about you. Or maybe it's more proper to say we couldn't care less. Who told you? Who was it that told you to pick up your mat and walk? The man, verse 13, the man who had been cured didn't know who it was because Jesus had slipped away from the crowd gathered there. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Verse 14, later Jesus found him in the temple and said, See, you have been made well. He finds the man. Jesus finds the man. Okay? He sees him in the temple. He's in the temple finally because the, the people who were sick, lame, ill, could not come into the temple. Now he can come into the temple. He could come to worship for the first time for 38 years. He's there and Jesus finds him and says, Wow, awesome. Isn't this great? Then what Jesus says, he says, Don't sin anymore in case something worse happens to you. Verse 15, the man went and proclaimed to the Jewish leaders that Jesus was the man who had made him well. We're going to come back to that as well. As a result, the Jewish leaders were harassing Jesus since he had done these things on the Sabbath. So what do you think about this man who God had done something great for in Jesus Christ? What do you think about him? Did he say, thank you, Jesus? Well, first of all, he didn't even bother to find out who he was. He didn't know who he was. Do you catch that? He goes to the temple. Who told you this? I don't know. The guy said, do it. I did it. Woohoo! He didn't even bother to find out who Jesus was when Jesus healed him. Boy, we could preach that for our day and age, couldn't we? God does things for us. We pray for people and the hill, and, 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 and we don't even come back and say thank you sometimes. Then when Jesus sees him in the temple and he says, hey, awesome. What was the first thing the man does? He runs and tattles. <laughs> he runs and tattles. It was Jesus. Jesus did it. He did it. He did it. I will call this the sin of ingratitude. Man, God does so many things for us. And all we can do being so blessed as we are some days is get up and look at what somebody else has and we're angry, we're mad, we're upset because somebody else has something we don't have that could, it matters less. I mean, it just couldn't matter less. And we get mad and upset. Or we're not thankful to God. Even as blessed as we are. How many of you live on at least $4,000 a year? Does everybody here live on at least $4,000 a year? You realize that if, if $4,000 is all you made in a year, that you would be better than 70% of the people in Costa Rica? Think about that. And yet, we are guilty often of the sin of ingratitude because somebody else has more. You see, this man didn't really seem to appreciate, for whatever reason, the, the, the awesome healing that Jesus offered him. He, he didn't come to believe in Jesus or, or to offer any kind of thanks to God. And, and this is not the only time in the Gospels this happens. You remember the story when Jesus heals the ten lepers? You remember that story? Ten lepers are there. These are people that are ousted for life, probably because the, the leprosy just didn't get cured. 
okay? Very, 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 very seldom. Jesus heals 10 people who are ousted. They can't touch anyone. Every time somebody comes close, they have to tell them, hey, I'm sick, I'm ugly, I'm terrible, I'm the worst person in the world. And to, in that day, that would have meant that I am one of the worst sinners in the world. I'm a terrible person. Don't come close to me. That was their response every time they met anyone. Jesus heals them of that, sends them to the temple to show that they're clean so they can hug their wife again, hold their children again, dance a dance with their grandchildren, whatever it is. One, you remember the story, one came back and said, thank you. One, only 10%. The sin of ingratitude, are, are we guilty of the sin of ingratitude? Do, do we ever fail to honor God by loving God with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, with all of our minds, with all of our strength? Because that's what we're asked to do when we become into relationship with God. Do we ever fail to thank God for the blessings the blessing of Him hearing and responding to our prayers? Do we fail to give God our best when we give in the offering? I'm pretty sure that I'm guilty of ingratitude sometimes, and I guess probably most of us are. And I sure don't want to beat us over the heads, but I just want us to think about it this morning. Does anybody in here want to be known as that ungrateful person? Yeah, I, I don't. I just tell you that. I, and and I, I want to avoid the sin of ingratitude. I, I believe that a big part of the answer to the sin of ingratitude is to worship God with all your might. Now, all this happens on the Sabbath. Okay? That's what starts the big mess, right? It all happens on the Sabbath. And so, you know, we thought this man was healed, this, that everybody who witnessed this healing, that this man himself. Everybody be thrilled with joy as they witness this sign, as, as, as uh, John would put it. But the religious authorities were, were really hung up on the Sabbath laws. Really, really hung up on the Sabbath laws. Now, now before I start criticizing the religious leaders, really, I, 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 want to, I want us to remember that observing the Sabbath is one of the Ten Commandments, one of the big ten, right? Number four, if, if you count them down by number. However, what happened in the first century in the Jewish teachings was regarding Sabbath, they'd been twisted into a long list of things that you couldn't do on the Sabbath. I mentioned before that you weren't allowed to travel. They had it down to the how many yards, basically, that you could travel on the Sabbath before you were working. You couldn't go that far from your property. And so the people who had it, they would drop a sandal when they'd gone the distance they were allowed to go. And then they would go that far again and drop a sandal because they were that close to their property still. Do that until they did whatever they wanted to do. So they made these laws up, but then they did their best to get around them. Makes a lot of sense, right? It sounds like Americans to me. I just think maybe that we've been reincarnated to... Well, we, no, never mind, we don't believe in reincarnation. I just read that. Been twisted into this long list of do's and don't do's and became so nitpicky about stuff, like stuff about not carrying your mat, that there were times they were so invested in these rules and laws, they totally forgot about humanity. They, for totally, they totally forgot to have compassion. They totally forgot that God doesn't or couldn't care less about our laws. What God really loves is humanity, His creation. Right, let's go back and read the commandment. Let's see what it says, okay? Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy. Six days you may work and do all your tasks, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. Do not do any work on it, not you, your sons or daughters, your male or female servants, your animals, or the immigrant who is living with you, because the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything that is in them in six days, but rested on the seventh day. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. So I want us to understand that 
a Sabbath rest, God takes it seriously from the very beginning. He works six days. That's the, that's the rhythm of creation. That's the rhythm for our lives that God created from day one. Even before humanity is, is, is or at the very beginning of humanity, excuse me. So now in the 21st century, we get to working so hard and resting less. We're working more so we can make more, enjoying it less, and I don't think that's God's design for our lives. You know, and it gets to the point that we get burnout. Um, just read that another one of our uh, mega church pastors, one of the up and coming young pastors, are just awesome, just called it quits the other day. Um, many thousands of people in his church, and he's called it quits. He said, I'm burnt out, I'm tired. That happens when we don't take Sabbath. Sabbath means to cease. That's what the word means, to quit, to stop, to cease. And what happened was when Jesus gave this, or God gave this commandment to the Israelites, what, what was happening was this. They'd been working in Egypt. None of the other religions of, of the Middle East have any kind of rest ethic. And so they, they worked in Egypt. Remember, they became slaves. They worked them harder and harder. So it wasn't like they worked them six days and they had a day off. They worked seven days a week. They started making it so hard for them, killing their babies. They did everything against them. And so Jesus says, or God, rather, God says, when, when now, or now that you're in this place, now that you're on your own, now that I've given you a land of your own, I want you to take a day and remember me, rest your bodies, rest your minds, and think about me. I want you to worship. I want you to relax. I think one of the most important ways that we can celebrate or remember the Sabbath is to connect to God in worship, to connect to God in, in raising God's name up. See, we believe that God is present when we come together. Matter of fact, when two or three agree together, God's there. And when we get together in a place like this, God is here to accept our praise and accept our worship as we sing our praises and we pray to God. So God blesses us, blesses us each week as we do that. It's a place where we have the opportunity to give, whether it's out of our pocketbook, whether it's our time, whatever it might be, it's a way for us to give. It's where we come and sing praises unto God. And so today I want to invite you to reclaim Sabbath in your life. If you are serious about our, what we, our ministry statement, then there's something that we need to do together. And that is remembering to have Sabbath. And I tell you right now, it's not the easiest thing. Chad and I work at that. You know, as I get older, I may be a little bit better at it than Chad, but I'm telling you, that's not always easy. There's always something to do. But God says, take time away. And I think the other part of that story is to be grateful because God has blessed us. Be grateful. God, we come to you today. We say thank you.